All right, guys, what we're trying to do real quick is do a review of one of the most complicated events in all of world history. And that is the French Revolution, which is complicated yet important. And the influence comes from the United States when Thomas Jefferson and the other founding fathers will take the ideas of the Enlightenment, guys of like you know, John Locke and Baron de Montesquieu and Voltaire, and they will put them together in the Declaration of Independence and the victory in the American Revolution. That will start a boomerang that will go from the Americas over to France, where in a 50-year period, a series of revolutions in the Americas and in France and the Caribbean will set about changing the world. And in France, there is the big question. Um, the king... Louis the 15th will lose the French and Indian War. It will leave him financially bankrupt, um, and his young son, Louis the 16th, is extremely young when he comes to power. He will also authorize aid over to the United States to help us in our revolution, further draining his coffers. So the young king of France is broke. He was also not a decisive person. And the problem is, France at the time was a large, nationalized together country. The one problem they had is they didn't know how to adequately collect taxes. The tax money was there, but it just couldn't be garnered. And the parliament, so to speak, in France at the time is called the Estates General. And it is made up of three large social classes. Number one, the high-ranking religious clergy. Number two, the also high-ranking nobles. Those are estates one and two. It's about five to ten percent of the entire population of France. The majority of people are in class number three, around 90 percent. Everything from your rich merchants and artisans to your low class wage laborers, upper middle class all the way down to the destitute and the poor. And the problem when it comes to voting in the Estates General, anytime, for example, the king wants to raise taxes on the upper classes, they vote no. And voting was done by a state as a whole. It wasn't individual head count, it was the majority of the people in the estate vote no, then the entire state votes no. Well, when it came time to raise taxes on the upper classes, the first and second estate, they voted no, and the third estate, in effect, votes yes. The third estate, the bulk of the population, loses every vote two to one. And so they want, the third estate wants independent voting. Let's vote by an individual. And so, as this problem comes to a head in the late 1780s, the king cannot collect taxes. He will appoint several ministers to collect them. All of them will fail, and he is forced to call the estates general. And in June of 1789, uh, the members of the third estate look for a sympathetic voters or like-minded people in the first and second estates, religious clergy and low-ranking nobles who they have more in common with. And they seek to join or create a new legislature called the National Assembly. And on the day they were going to go institute it, they find the door to their meeting place locked because the king also wanted the third estate to meet separately. Now, the third estate believes the king did this on purpose. So they march to his palace in Paris and they scream and yell and they stand on his tennis courts and they take what is known as the tennis court oath where they say, we are not going to leave until you adhere to demands a new constitution and a new government is created. They were calling themselves the National Assembly. When the king finally resents, this is what I call mini revolution number two, first revolution was when they said, hey, we're going to go stand on your tennis court. The new French parliament 
is called the National Constituent Assembly. And they're going to create a new government and a new constitutional monarchy, very similar to the one over in, in England. But the king, young king, makes some mistakes. He begins to bring French military troops, and they maneuver just outside the gates of Paris. And the poor people of Paris see this. And out on the countryside at the time, the people at, up to this point were doing okay until two horribly cold winters come in and pretty much destroys all of the crops and the feed for the people of, of um, Paris. But the urban cities are having trouble. Out the countryside, people are like, you know, whatever. Just, you know, deal with it. They're farming as they always do. Well, when Louis, sorry to get on a tangent there, moves people, soldiers near Paris, his citizens begin to freak out. I don't know if you can see the slide, but here is the great upside down, you know, um, triangle or the piece of pizza with the clergy, the nobility, small in population compared to everyone else. Well, the people in France need to defend themselves in Paris, excuse me, against military attack. So they need weapons. The one thing they don't have is gunpowder. So they march on an old medieval prison right in the middle of the city on July 14th, 1789. They march on the Bastille. And as they try and get in to get gunpowder and weapons, the garrison opens fire. Now, shooting into, into the civilians enrages the population. They tear into the Bastille. They kill the soldiers. They behead the commander and actually parade his head around on a pike. They release all seven prisoners there, but there is absolutely no gunpowder or guns in the Bastille. So the people begin to tear the Bastille down as it is a symbol of absolute power in France. At the same time, the king is out hunting, and he gets back and says, ah, nothing big happened, and people are like, no, dude, there is a revolution going on right now. Well, when the people realize what their power is, this is the first of many journeys, or journeys, where the poor people of Paris realize their collective political power. They can force things to happen. And so as things start to get <clears throat> out of hand, the nobles step up, and on August 4th is a time known, in the in-between period, is known as the Great Fear, <coughs> excuse me, where the people loot and they burn and they destroy medieval chateaus and they burn documents, property ownership, tax records, and the nobles all stand up and say, hey, we are no more going to listen to our aristocratic noble rights and privileges. We are all equal. This is outstanding. And the problem with that is those were powers that were already stripped from them. But they do it. It's a, it's a good show. And by the end of August 1789, the new French legislature creates a new constitution modeled after the United States. And it's called the Declaration of the Rights of a Man and a Citizen. President Thomas Jefferson was actually, well, he was Secretary of State, he was actually in Paris at the time, and he helped write the thing. And the ideas come from the Enlightenment, and once again, the American Revolution. But when Louis gets it, he realizes he's going to be made a constitutional monarch, and he kind of balks. He doesn't sign it right away, further heightening the scares of the people. So on October 5th, the women, the women who worked in the market, these buff, strong, husky women doing manual labor, will lead a march out to the Paris of Ver Palace of Versailles, 12 miles from Paris. And they demand that the king come home. They actually break into the palace and are going after Marie Antoinette. And the king finally says, okay. He signs the new constitution. And the people don't believe him, so they march him back to Paris. And the king is living in his old palace, which is today the Louvre. But he's under house arrest. The king is trapped. The people just don't trust him. 
And this is where things are going to get interesting. As the new government is built, it will go to the upper classes. People who have been clambering the upper middle class and the middle class. They've been shut out of political power. They've used the strength of the poor, the lower classes, to propel them. And once they got inside the clubhouse, they forget about everybody outside. We want legal equality, but not social equality. You people are beneath me. Ooh, thank you for helping me get here, but stay away. This will further anger the lower middle class and the lower classes. And they want to create a constitutional monarchy, which creates its own set of problems. The economy doesn't get better. And the problem is people are starving. And the people of Paris depended upon bread. They ate pounds of it a day. A little bit of bread makes you feel full. While the king was trying to dabble in economics, like he was going to solve the problems, and he caused a catastrophe where the price of grain inflated. So there's a lot of problems in the urban areas of Paris. The countryside was okay until a devastatingly cold winter hit. And then nobody has any food. And it is at this point where the king and Marie Antoinette attempt to flee. They are close to the border of Germany, near the town of Varennes, France, just miles from the border, where they are discovered. And the people of Paris find out the guy working against them, the leader of the counter-revolutionary activity, is their own king. So he's brought back to Paris. And this is where other European royals step in. Marie Antoinette is the youngest of 16 children to Mar Maria Therese, the, the queen of the, Haps the empress of the ha Austrian Habsburg Empire. And Marie's brothers, Frederick and William, king of the Holy Roman Empire in Prussia, say, if you harm the hair on one royal head, we are going to militarily invade. We are, an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. And this will change the revolution. Because there was a political party known as the Jacobins. They were the poor working class people fueled by a group of individuals called the sans Culot. And this was the, the name of the garb they wore. They were urban workers. They were wage workers. They were, you know, the poorest wage workers. And in the new assembly, they were represented by people called Girondists. And they panic. And the problem with the San Kolo is they're not educated. And they react a lot to anger. So when they hear that they can be attacked by the Holy Roman Empire in Prussia, they declare war on Austria. And it is the war ongoing outside of Europe that will change and make the revolution pretty violent. Hadn't been that violent up to this point. But now it's about to get crazy where another revolution takes place. Early on, the war against the other forces of Europe is, goes very badly. And so a new city government, a new city council is created, taken from the different wards or neighborhoods of Paris. And the people in charge of this are increasingly radical and ang angry. The royal family is taken from the palace and they have to hide in the legislative assembly. All right? The, the, the Girondists have them under, under house arrests. And for some reason in September, the people, September 1792, the people of Paris break into all the jails and they kill 1,200 people in jail for being counter-revolutionaries. And I'm like, well, if the king put you in jail, you're probably not a counter-revolutionary. But you couldn't reason with them. And 1,200 people are killed. And when this is over, another new government is called. It's no longer the National Constituent Assembly. It's known as the Convention. And it's something where all males can, can vote. These were the poorest of the poor, the people shut out by the National Constituent Assembly. They knew what they wanted. 
They wanted to feed their families, and they wanted the inflation of grain to stop. No one had ever cared about them, so now they're going to go crazy and make people listen. December of 1792, Louis is guillotined, Marie Antoinette shortly thereafter, and the French government declares war on all of Europe. England, Austria, Holy Roman Empire, Prussia, and they're facing a civil war at home. So from the fall of 1793 to the summer of 1794 is known as the Reign of Terror, where the new government will create two committees, the Committee of Public Safety, who's in charge of protecting France internally. I liken it to the United States FBI, so to speak. The other one is the Committee of General Security, they are to protect France from external threats, like the CIA. While we have basic rights and privileges, we're going to vote them in and say, while we have freedom of speech and freedom of the press, we're going to throw those out and declare martial law while we are at war. And taking over for the Committee of Public Safety is a guy named Maximilien Robespierre. And he will oversee thousands of trials of nobles and rich people, enemies against the revolution, and most of them will be beheaded. By the winter, he takes the revolution out to the provinces, and he has mayors executed, city officials executed, old school nobles executed, anybody who's a threat, they are killed. By spring, he's back inside Paris, and he has members of the sans culot executed, people who helped put him in power. He's gone crazy with bloodlust. He gets anyone who threatens his power executed. By June 10th, a law is passed where he can execute somebody without evidence. He just points his finger, bam, and they're executed. But he walks into the legislature on June 26th, and says that the members of the new government are a threat to his power. They need to pass a law allowing him to execute them. They're like, Robespierre, are you stupid? You want us to pass a law allowing you to execute us? Are you out of your mind? So Maximilian Robespierre is taken out, and he is executed, ending the reign of terror. And when the people of France step back, they see that their country is destroyed. 40,000 of their own people were executed in a series of cascading revolutions. And so they create a new government called the Directory, which was going to be run by five elders, all of which were rich landowning men. Well, the whole thing got started when there was a problem in the government being run by rich landowning men. So what the French Revolution is doing, I don't know. <laughs> But they are able to conclude peace with Europe. And coincidentally, on October 5th, the same day the women years before went to get Louis in 1792, a food riot takes place. The people are still starving. The Directory, a very weak government, who will rule from 1795 to 1799, doesn't work out. They go and get a young artillery general who distinguished himself in the wars with England and Austria named Napoleon Bonaparte. He has the directory elect him consul, and within two years, he will be named emperor of France. So the French Revolution started with a weak king. He is overthrown. A government of rich landowning males is overthrown. Come on in. And we wind up right back with not only a king, but an emperor. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? Um, so we have to do a project for American history. And, uh, sorry. Ah.